Hi, and welcome to this video about scientific notation. In this video, we will explore what scientific notation is and how to write and compare numbers in scientific notation. First, what is scientific notation? The idea of scientific notation was developed by Archimedes in the third century BCE, where he outlined a system for calculating the number of grains of sand in the universe, which he found to be one followed by 63 zeros. His work was based on place value, a novel concept at the time. Scientific notation is simply a way of writing numbers. It is especially useful in expressing very large or very small numbers because it is shorter and more efficient and it shows magnitude very easily. Every real number can be written as a product of two parts, a decimal part times an integer power of 10, m times 10 to the n, where one is less than or equal to m, which is less than 10, and n is an integer. Why 10? Our number system is based on 10, and each place value is 10 times the previous place value. 110 equals 10 ones, 100 equals 10 tens, etc. Let's look at writing large numbers using this notation system. We can write the number 1 as 1 times 10 to the 0. Remember, 10 to the 0 is 1, so this is equal to 1 times 1, which is equal to 1. We can also write the number 13 as 1.3 times 10 to the 1, because 1.3 times 10 is equal to 13. Or we can write the number 134 as 1.34 times 10 squared, because that's equal to 1.34 times 10 times 10. You get 134. Let's look again at Archimedes' findings. He expressed the number of grains of sand in the universe as one followed by 63 zeros. We could write that out, but that would take way too long and be highly inefficient. In scientific notation, this would be one times 10 to the 63rd power, a much more compact and efficient way of expressing this number. The number of zeros in the gigantic number is represented by the exponent. In the fully written number, it's important to realize that each time we multiply by 10, we move to a new place value. So adding a zero means multiplying by 10. A light year, the distance light travels in a year, is 5,878,600,000,000 miles. Let's express this in scientific notation. Often, this is described as moving the decimal point, which doesn't actually happen. We simply need to count the number of times we multiply by 10. The decimal part is created from the first block that begins and ends with a non-zero number. In other words, the block can contain a zero, but we don't use the zeros at the end. Our decimal must be greater than or equal to one and less than 10. So we always start from the ones place. Here we have 5.8786 times 10 to the something power. This is where we count the number of times our decimal is multiplied by 10. We need to count from the decimal we created to the end of the number. So 5.8786 times 10 to the one is equal to 58.786. 5.8786 times 10 squared is equal to 587.86. And then 5.8786 times 10 cubed is equal to 5878.6. And so on and so on until we reach 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 5.8786 times 10 to the 12th. So in scientific notation, a light year can be expressed as 5.8786 times 10 to the 12th miles. But what if you wanted to take a number written using scientific notation and change it into standard form? A light year can also be expressed as 
0.07 times 10 to the 15th meters. We can easily change this number to standard form. Start with the decimal part, 9.4607, and multiply by 10 a total of 15 times. This tells us that a light year is 9 quadrillion, 460 trillion, 700 billion meters. Let's look at a couple more examples before we move on. If I Google light year, I'm given about 7 billion, 380 million search results. Let's express this number in scientific notation. So, as you can see, I was given 7.38 times 10 to the 9th search results. On average, there are 3.72 times 10 to the 13th cells in a human body. Express this number in standard form. The exponent 13 tells us that we have 13 numbers after the decimal, which gives us 3.72 followed by 11 zeros. If we multiply this by 10 13 times, we see that there are 37.2 trillion cells in the human body. So now we know how to write large numbers using scientific notation, but what about small numbers? First, let's recall how negative exponents work. For example, 10 to the negative 1 is equal to 1 over 10 to the first power, which is equal to 1 over 10. And 10 to the negative 2 power is equal to 1 over 10 squared, which is equal to 1 over 100. Where positive exponents represent multiplication, negative exponents represent division. Again, the number 1 can be written as 1 times 10 to the 0 power, which is equal to 1 times 1 equals 1. The number 0.1 can be written as 1 times 10 to the negative 1, which is equal to 1 times 1 over 10, which is equal to 0.1. The number 0 0.01 can be written as 1 times 10 to the negative second, which is equal to 1 times 1 over 10 squared, which is equal to 1 times 1 over 100, which is equal to 0 0.01. The wavelength of green light is 0 0.0000055 meters. Let's see this in scientific notation. We begin the same way as with large numbers, creating the decimal from the chunk book ended by non-zero numbers. Our result will resemble 5.5 .5 times 10 to the negative something power. Now, we count the number of times our decimal is divided by 10. 5.5 .5 times 10 to the negative 1 is equal to 0 .55. 5.5 .5 times 10 to the negative second power is equal to 0 .055. 5.5 times 10 to the negative third power is equal to 0 .0055 and so on and so on, until we reach 5.5 .5 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, negative seventh power. So in scientific notation, the wavelength of green light can be expressed as 5.5 .5 times 10 to the negative seventh meters. The radius of a hydrogen atom is 2.5 times 10 to the negative 11th meters. We can express this in standard form by starting with the decimal part 2.5 and dividing by 10 a total of 11 times. This tells us that the radius of a hydrogen atom is 0 0.0000000000025 meters. I hope that this video helped you to understand how to work with numbers in scientific notation. Thanks for watching and happy studying. Hey everyone, welcome to this Memetrics video on the physical and chemical properties of matter. Have you ever classified something based on what you observed about it? Perhaps you've distinguished a dog from a cat based on the dog's larger structure, flappy ears, and longer head shape. 
Maybe you've distinguished a chocolate lab from a golden retriever because the chocolate lab was brown, had shorter hair, and more compact hair. What we observe helps us to make distinctions. Being able to make observable distinctions is a very good and necessary tool in life. And this absolutely applies to the sciences. Now, properties are just characteristics of something. A physical property describes an observable change in a substance's characteristics, but does not affect the chemical makeup of that substance. Let's take a look at some examples of physical properties of matter. Boiling point. A substance's boiling point is a physical property. For instance, when water or H2O boils, so when it converts from a liquid to a gas or water to steam, it is still water. The chemical identity is still H2O. The chemical property hasn't changed, only its physical property has. So if there is an observable change, but the chemical identity does not change, then you have a physical change. Melting point. Take ice, for example. When ice melts into liquid water, the chemical identity doesn't change. The identity of ice is still H2O. When ice melts, the only thing changing is its physical state. A physical property is anything you can hear, see, touch, smell, or measure and observe in some form without changing the chemical identity of the substance. Along with boiling point and melting point, this includes solubility. This is a substance ability to dissolve in a solvent. It also includes pressure, color, shape, malleability, which is a substance's capacity to change form or deform under pressure, volume, this describes the amount of space occupied by a substance, viscosity, the thickness or semi-fluidity of a substance because of its internal friction, temperature, electric charge, which is a property that causes matter to encounter force when inside of a magnetic field, density, which describes how close or how far apart the atoms within a substance are. These, along with others, are all examples of physical properties of matter but these do not change the chemical identity of the substance. Now, a chemical property, on the other hand, can only be observed after a chemical reaction has taken place. So after the chemical has gone through an identity change. This includes irregular change in color. If you mix white and red together and get pink or light red, then that's probably not a sign of a chemical reaction. That's just what happens when you mix the colors red and white together. However, if you mix a red and a white substance together and get blue, then you may have a chemical reaction. Change in consistency. When two substances are mixed together and there is a change in consistency, then this may reflect a change in the molecular structure. So if you take two runny liquids and mix them together and the product is a thick jelly substance, then you might have a chemical reaction. Change in luster. Luster refers to the reflective quality of a substance. So if you mix two dull, murky substances together and they produce a really glossy or polished substance, then you might have a chemical reaction. The formation of froth or bubbles may suggest that a gas has been composed in the chemical reaction. Change in odor. Now, if it's just a slight change in odor, it's probably not a chemical reaction. So if I mix a substance that smells like honey, this is just a silly example, but I mix it with a substance that smells like vanilla and the ending result smells like some type of syrup, then it's more than likely not a chemical reaction. If you take those same two substances together and their product smells like a smelly sock, then you may have a chemical reaction. Change in temperature. You can use a thermometer to take the temperature of each substance before, and if there is a change after the two have been combined, then there may be a chemical reaction. Precipitate formation. This just means that an insoluble solid is formed from a liquid solution. If this happens, then you probably are witnessing a chemical reaction. So, physical properties are observed without the substance undergoing a chemical identity makeover and chemical properties are observed after chemical reactions have taken place.
Atoms are the building blocks of the universe. They make up everything you see around you. But what makes up an atom? At the very center of an atom is the nucleus, which is made up of small particles called protons and neutrons. Protons are very small, positively charged particles, and neutrons are neutral particles that have no charge. Atoms can have just one proton or they can have multiple. A group of atoms that all have the exact same number of protons are called an element. For example, hydrogen is an element with one proton in the nucleus and carbon is an element with six protons. In general, an atom will have a specific number of neutrons in the nucleus, meaning the atom won't lose or gain any neutrons for a very long time. This is called a stable atom. Usually, a stable atom has an equal number of neutrons and protons, but there are exceptions. To find the mass number of an element, you add the number of protons and neutrons together. So, protons plus neutrons equal mass number. This gives us names like carbon-12 or carbon-14, which are types of carbon atoms used in carbon dating. Orbiting the atom's positively charged center are particles with a negative charge called electrons. The electrons are attracted to the positive nucleus, but they can escape their orbit by an outside force. Atoms have a certain number of electrons orbiting the nucleus. If the number of electrons is equal to the number of protons, the overall electric charge of the atom is neutral. If the atom has more electrons than protons, its charge will be negative. With fewer electrons than protons, the atom will have a positive charge. The electrons determine how atoms interact with each other. Atoms can share electrons to form molecules, which are particles made up of many atoms. Water is made up of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. These three atoms share electrons. Now that we have talked about the different parts of the atom, let's summarize a few properties of atoms. Atoms have an atomic number, which is the number of protons in the nucleus. The periodic table arranges atoms in increasing atomic number. The charge of an atom is calculated based on the difference between the number of protons in the nucleus and the number of electrons orbiting the nucleus. Here's a quick review. An atom is made up of protons, electrons, and neutrons. The number of electrons will determine how atoms interact with one another and decide if the atom as a whole is positive, negative, or neutral. The mass number of an atom is found by adding together the number of protons and neutrons. And finally, the charge of an atom is determined by the number of protons and electrons in the atom. Thank you so much for watching and see you guys next time. Hey guys, welcome to this Memetrics video over chemical reactions. In this video, we'll take a look at the definition of a chemical reaction, characteristics of chemical reactions, types of chemical reactions, and other things that are pretty important to know. First, the definition. A chemical reaction has taken place when a chemical substance alters its initial chemical identity and takes on a new chemical identity. So basically what's happening is you have at least two molecules that come together perfectly, hitting each other in the exact right way, and they, these two molecules, change into something else. That's typically how all types of reactions work. For example, you have an eager and excited teacher who says, science is very important, you need to learn. So do your homework, do your homework, do your homework. Then let's add to the equation that one guy in the class who says, I didn't do my homework. When these two come together and react, the product will be a very unhappy teacher and a slightly terrified young boy. In this example, we can see some observable differences after the reaction has occurred. Well, the same thing is true with chemical reactions. Every chemical reaction yields a different result, which inevitably means that chemical reactions will not all have identical observable properties. 
However, if you mix two chemicals together and want to know if they reacted with one another, you could look for these observable characteristics. Irregular change in color. If you mix white and red together and get pink or light red, then that's probably not a sign of a chemical reaction. That's just what happens when you mix the colors red and white together. However, if you mix a red and white substance together and get blue, then you might have a chemical reaction. Change in consistency. When two substances are mixed together and there's a change in consistency, then this may reflect a change in the molecular structure. So if you take two runny liquids and mix them together and the product is a thick jelly substance, then you might have a chemical reaction. Change in luster. Luster refers to the reflective quality of a substance. So if you mix two dull, murky substances together and they produce a really glossy or polished substance, then you might have a chemical reaction. Appearance of bubbles or froth. The formation of froth or bubbles may suggest that a gas has been composed in the chemical reaction. Change in odor. Now, if it's just a slight change in odor, it's probably not a chemical reaction. So if I mix a substance that smells like honey, now this is just a silly example, with a substance that smells like vanilla and the ending result smells like some type of syrup, then it's more than likely not a chemical reaction. If you take those two same substances and mix them together and their product smells like a smelly sock, then you may have a chemical reaction. Change in temperature. You can use a thermometer to take the temperature of each substance before, and if there's a change after the two have been combined, then there may be a chemical reaction. Precipitate formation. This just means that an insoluble solid is formed from a liquid solution. If this happens, then you probably are witnessing a chemical reaction. So those are some observable characteristics that may signify that a chemical reaction has taken place. Now let's take a look at five different types of chemical reactions. Number one, combination reaction or synthesis reaction. A combination reaction is pretty straightforward. It can be defined as when substances are mixed together and they form a new compound. Here's what the combination reaction equation looks like. A plus B yields AB. As you can see, these two substances literally combine to form a new substance. An example of this is carbon solid and oxygen gas reacting together to form carbon dioxide gas. Number two, single replacement reaction. A single replacement reaction, also known as displacement reaction, can be defined as a chemical reaction in which one element displaces or replaces, whichever word you would like to use, a comparable element in the compound, causing a chemical change in the compound. Here is what that looks like in equation form. A and B plus C yield AC plus B. As you can see in this equation, C has stepped in and replaced or displaced B. An example of this is the combination of copper and silver nitrate. Three, double replacement reaction. A double replacement reaction can be defined as a chemical reaction in which the ions of two compounds swap with one another within a liquid solution and configure two new compounds. Here's what that looks like in equation form. AB plus CD yield AC plus BD. An example of this is the combination of sodium sulfide and hydrogen chloride to produce sodium chloride and hydrogen sulfide. Sodium and hydrogen are cations and sulfur and chlorine are anions. The cations and anions switch places during the reaction to form new compounds. Number four, decomposition reaction. Decomposition and composition are opposites. In a decomposition reaction, a single complex compound is broken down, or decomposed, into a more basic substance. Here's what that looks like as an equation. A, B yield A plus B. Now, there are actually three different subtypes of decomposition reactions. Thermal decomposition, photo decomposition, and electrolytic decomposition. The term that precedes the word decomposition refers to the type of energy used to make the decomposition possible. So in thermal decomposition, heat is added to the complex compound to decompose it. In photo decomposition, photons, or light, is added to the complex compound to decompose it. And in electrolytic decomposition, electric current passes through a liquid solution to decompose it. For example, the electrolysis of water. Water decomposes into hydrogen and oxygen when an electric current is added. Number five, 
combustion reaction. A combustion reaction can be defined as a chemical reaction where a substance mixes with oxygen and produces substantial amounts of energy that take place in the form of heat and light. An example of this would be the combining of methane and oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water. Now, the last thing we'll talk about, as promised, is other things that are pretty useful to know. There's a lot that I could go into here, but I just want to talk about two things. The first is basic language, and the second is reaction rates. Basic language. You should already know this, but here it is. The individual substances, before they are combined together to react, are called reactants or reagents. These reactants, once combined, yield a product or products. Secondly, reaction rates. Now, there's a lot that goes into this, but I'll give you the most basic idea of what this means. Chemical reactions are all over the place when it comes to speed or rate it takes for the reaction to occur. Some reactions happen instantaneously and others take years and years. Well, reaction rates are dependent upon certain characteristics of the reactants. There are two variables in which the reaction rate is dependent on, the change in concentration of a substance and the time it takes for the change to be observed. Well, this rate of change can be altered via a catalyst, which speeds up the chemical reactions, or an inhibitor, which slows down chemical reactions. Understanding how chemical reactions work is important, but understanding the rate at which they take place is equally as important. I hope that this video over chemical reactions was helpful. If you enjoyed it, then be sure to give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for further videos. See you guys next time. We interact with water in its different forms every day. It's a simple little molecule, just two hydrogens and one oxygen, but somehow it makes life as we know it possible. Today, we're going to take a look at the physical properties of the water molecule and learn what makes it so special. To understand the macroscopic properties of water, we need to understand the molecular properties first. So let's start by looking at the structure of an individual water molecule. We know the chemical formula of water is H2O, two hydrogens covalently bonded to one oxygen. This means that the hydrogen and oxygen both donate an electron to form each bond. However, even though hydrogen and oxygen each contribute an electron to the bond, the electrons are not equally shared between the two atoms. Oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen, which means the oxygen wants the electrons more than hydrogen. This leads to the electrons spending more time around the oxygen, resulting in a partial negative charge on the oxygen, denoted by negative delta. Since the electrons spend more time near the oxygen, they spend less time by the hydrogen, resulting in a partial positive charge on the hydrogens, denoted by positive delta. When electrons are unevenly distributed in a covalent bond like this, the bond is described as polar. This is represented by an arrow pointing to the partial negative of the bond with a plus sign at the partial positive end. You'll also hear this called a bond dipole. So, we've established that each OH bond is polarized, but what about the entire water molecule? Because water is bent, a result of the two lone pairs on oxygen, the hydrogens are on one side of the oxygen, so their bond dipoles add together to create a large molecular dipole. Said another way, Water is a highly polar molecule, where one side is partially positive and the other is partially negative. Now, what does this mean for when water molecules get together? Because positive charges are attracted to negative charges, called electrostatic interactions, water molecules orient themselves so that the partially positive hydrogens are next to the partially negative oxygens of different water molecules. This leads to the formation of hydrogen bonds, an interaction between a partially positive hydrogen and the lone pair of a partially negative acceptor, in this case, oxygen. Because oxygen has two lone pairs, each oxygen can hydrogen bond with two hydrogens. Thus, each water molecule can have up to four hydrogen bonds, resulting in a highly interconnected web. Electrostatic interactions in hydrogen bonds are types of intermolecular interactions. These interactions are individually weak. 
much weaker than covalent bonds. But when there are lots of them, they significantly influence the physical properties of the substance. Let's consider this for water. Water is very cohesive and adhesive. That's because of its intermolecular interactions. Basically, because water is polar and readily hydrogen bonds, it forms strong interactions with itself and other polar molecules. In other words, it sticks to things. This is why water is a liquid at standard temperature and pressure. The intermolecular interactions hold the molecules together, stopping them from flying away and becoming a gas. These interactions also make water a good solvent, so much so that it is often referred to as the universal solvent. This means that many substances readily dissolve in water because of the favorable intermolecular interactions. You will often hear these substances referred to as hydrophilic or water-loving, which again simply means that they form strong intermolecular interactions with water. We can use this reasoning to explain other physical properties of water. For instance, why does it take so long to boil a pot of water? It's because the specific heat of water is the highest of any common liquid, meaning water requires more heat, or energy, to increase its temperature. That's because to increase the temperature, the kinetic energy of the water molecules must increase. But to do that, the hydrogen bonds need to be broken, which takes extra energy, resulting in a specific heat of one calorie per gram kilocalorie. Compare this to ethanol, which has a specific heat of 0.6 calorie per gram kilocalorie. It takes almost twice the energy to increase the temperature of water than ethanol, all because of the intermolecular interactions. Similar reasoning helps us understand why significant energy is required to melt and vaporize water. In ice, water molecules are in a set network of hydrogen bonds. To melt ice into liquid water, those hydrogen bonds have to be broken, though they are reformed in the liquid phase. This results in a high latent heat of melting. During the vaporization process, water molecules move into the gas phase, which requires a ton of energy because hydrogen bonds must be completely severed for that molecule to be released. This results in a large heat of vaporization. All right, let's finish with the review. We've examined the structure of an individual water molecule and established that it is highly polar. This allows water to form strong intermolecular interactions, like hydrogen bonds, with itself and other polar molecules. These interactions account for most of the physical properties of water, like its cohesiveness, adhesiveness, and high specific heat. More generally, we've also learned that to understand the bulk properties of any substance, we first need to understand the molecular properties and the types of intermolecular interactions that molecules can form. We hope you feel prepped and empowered. Thanks for watching. Hi, and welcome to this video on kinetic and potential energy. Energy is a very important concept in physics that helps us describe how much work an object can do. While the word energy is often used in everyday language, the meaning in physics is very specific and may not exactly coincide with the meanings you are used to hearing. Today, we'll be looking at the different types of energy and how they affect the world around us every day. There are two main categories of energy, kinetic energy and potential energy. Kinetic energy applies to objects in motion. Potential energy is the stored energy of an object and depends on the object's position. Different types of energy may express energy values in different combinations of units, but the standard unit for energy is the joule. First, let's talk about kinetic energy. Since kinetic energy applies to moving objects, it is dependent on the object's velocity. The equation for kinetic energy is kinetic energy equals one-half times the mass times the velocity squared. Here, it is apparent that when V equals zero, the kinetic energy is also equal to zero. This makes sense because if the object is at rest, 
it won't have any kinetic energy. Also, kinetic energy is directly proportional to the mass of the object and the velocity squared. So the faster an object is moving, and the heavier it is, the higher the kinetic energy will be. Kinetic energy is closely related to work. In physics, work is a measure of the energy it takes to move something a given distance. A force must act on the object in order to move it and cause work to be done. You must take all of the forces acting on the object into consideration when thinking about the total amount of work that was done on the object. So, the equation for work in terms of force and distance is the net work done on an object, W net, equals the net force that acted on the object, F net, times the distance over which the work was done, or D. However, it is sometimes more useful to think of work in terms of energy. The work energy theorem states that work is equal to the change in the kinetic energy of an object. So, work is equal to the final value of the kinetic energy minus the initial value of the kinetic energy. It is also important to note that work can be either positive or negative. For example, if you're pushing a box across a table, the direction you're pushing the box would be considered positive direction. The friction between the box and the table is a force in the direction opposite to the motion, so the work being done by friction is negative. Basically, negative work makes it more difficult to get positive work done. Let's think about an example using the work energy theorem. Imagine you are standing at the top of a building and you are holding a ball over the edge. While you are holding the ball over the edge, it is at rest. If you let it go, it will be in free fall until it reaches the ground and is at rest again. There are several questions we need to ask here. Are there any forces at work here? If so, what are they? Is work being done when you drop the ball? Does the amount of work change as the ball falls to the ground? To answer the first question, yes, there is a force at work here. The force that is acting here is gravity. Specifically, the force of gravity equals mass times the object's acceleration. Gravity is pulling the ball to the ground when you drop it, and the acceleration due to gravity, g, is making the ball go faster and faster as it gets closer to the ground. The positive direction here is downward in the direction of the movement. Since there is kinetic energy when the ball is moving, remember it has velocity, then work is being done on the ball by gravity. So what is the total amount of work being done here from when the ball is at rest to the time it hits the ground? Well, the velocity is zero at both of those times. So the total work done is zero after the ball hits the ground. This is because the normal force of the ground pushes upward on the ball and causes negative work to be done. The work from gravity is then canceled out at that point. However, if we look at the amount of work done when the ball is only halfway to the ground, we will have a non-zero value of kinetic energy since the ball has a non-zero velocity. When we plug this into the work energy theorem with one-half times the mass times the initial velocity squared equals zero, we will get a non-zero value for work. So, the value for the amount of work done will change depending on where the ball is on its way to the ground. So where does potential energy come in? Potential energy depends on an object's position. Unlike kinetic energy, an object can have a non-zero potential energy when it is at rest or when it is moving. The example where we are dropping the ball from the building involves a form of potential energy called gravitational potential energy. As you might imagine, the name comes from the fact that we are dealing with the gravitational force. The equation that we use for gravitational potential energy is gravitational potential energy equals mass times acceleration times the height of the object from the ground. So, in our previous example, the potential energy is at its highest when you are holding the ball at the top of the building because h is at its maximum value. The mass of the ball is not changing here, 
and g is always 9.8 meters per second squared near the surface of the Earth. So the potential energy is entirely dependent on how far away the ball is from the ground in this problem. When the ball hits the ground, it has no more potential energy. It's important to understand that during the fall from the top of the building to the ground, the ball has both kinetic and potential energy, and both are constantly changing. If you look again at the equation for gravitational potential energy, you might notice that the mg is actually the gravitational force acting on the object. And when we multiply that by the distance the object travels, we get the work done against gravity or by gravity, depending on the direction. So, if you're lifting the object up from the ground, you're doing work against gravity. And when the object is in free fall, gravity is doing the work. Work must be computed over some distance or some change in h. It doesn't make sense to ask what the work is at one point, say, three meters above the ground. For work, you might ask something like, what is the work done when you lift the ball from a height of two meters to a height of three meters? So the work done by gravity is actually equal to the change of potential energy. Another type of potential energy is elastic potential energy. Elastic potential energy involves any type of object that can be compressed, stretched, or otherwise deformed in such a way that it wants to move back into an equilibrium position. Common examples are springs or rubber bands. Elastic materials all have a spring constant, K, that is dependent on the material and describes how elastic it is. The force of a compressed or stretched spring is described by Hooke's law, where K is the spring constant and delta X is the distance that the spring has been displaced. When the spring is in a stretched or compressed state, the potential energy associated with the state is Potential energy of the spring equals one-half times k times delta x squared. So let's think about an example of a typical spring problem. Imagine a spring attached to a wall. When the spring is not compressed or stretched, the end of the spring rests at the spot we will call x equals zero. At this point, it has no stored energy. If you compress the spring by pushing it to the left, you've moved it by a distance delta x, and it now has stored or potential energy. The force of the spring is pressing in the opposite direction of the direction that you've compressed it. Conversely, if you stretch the spring by delta x, the force now points in the opposite direction. The elastic potential energy is the same here if delta x is the same. Now that we've learned all about kinetic energy, potential energy, and work, let's test it out with some problems. Let's say you have a bowling ball of mass m on a ramp that is height h from the ground. What is the potential energy when it is at rest at the top of the ramp and when it is at a height of one-third times h? Is it a, zero, zero, b, 0, 1 third mgh, c, mgh, 1 third mgh, or d, mgh, impossible to tell without knowing how long the ramp is. The correct answer is c. The bowling ball will have potential energy as long as it is on the ramp. So it won't be zero until it reaches the ground. At the top, it is a height of h from the ground. And when it is at a height of one-third h, that is how far it is from the ground. The path it takes doesn't matter. In this same example, how much total work is done from the time the bowling ball is going a speed of v to the time that it hits the ground, assuming it stops when it hits the ground? Is it a, negative one-half mv squared, b, one-half mv squared, or c, zero?
the correct answer is A. Here the initial velocity equals V and the final velocity equals zero because the bowling ball is stopped by the ground. Plugging these into the work energy theorem, we get negative one-half mv squared. The reason work is negative here is that we have to take into account the work done by the ground to stop the ball. This value is the network of the ball-ground system. Imagine you have a spring with spring constant k hanging from the ceiling. In its equilibrium position, it is a height of two meters off of the ground. What is the elastic potential energy of the spring when you pull it down until it is only 1.5 meters off the ground? Is it A, 2K, B, 1 8 K, C, K, or D, 9 8 K? The correct answer is B. You've displaced the spring by 2 minus 1.5 equals 0 0.5, or 1 half meters. Plugging this into potential energy of the spring equation, you get 1 eighth K. I hope this review was helpful. Thanks for watching, and happy studying. Welcome to this Mometrics video on Newton's first law of motion. Sir Isaac Newton began his discovery of the first law as he sat in his mother's garden and witnessed an apple fall from a tree. He then started to formulate theories on why this might happen and why things fall towards the center of the earth. Well, Newton's first law of motion declares that an object will remain at rest or in uniform motion in a straight line unless acted upon by an external force. This is where we get the concept of inertia, where a physical object resists any change in its velocity. An object stays in its state of motion unless acted on by a force that changes that motion. So where do we see this law play out? If you were to throw a ball out into space, the ball would keep going and going and never stop because there's no gravity in space, no friction and no air resistance working against the ball. If you were to roll a ball on grass, the ball would come to an eventual stop in this setting, the ball has friction from the grass, air resistance, and gravity working against it. The ball will also stop if it hits something, like a fence or a pole. Let's look at how we can more clearly see inertia play out. Imagine someone is driving in a car at 60 miles an hour, and then all of a sudden slam on their brakes. What happens? Well, your car comes to a pretty quick stop, but your body flies forward. Why is that? Inertia. Your body wants to resist the change in velocity and continue on how it was before. This is why we have airbags. So, quick review. What does Newton's first law of motion or law of inertia state? An object will remain at rest or in uniform motion in a straight line unless acted upon by an external force. In 1687, Isaac Newton published his Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, where he discusses in detail his three laws of motion. He used these laws to explore the motion of several material objects and systems. Hey everyone, and welcome to this Mometrics video over Newton's second law of motion. If you haven't already, be sure to check out our video on Newton's first law. Newton's second law of motion describes how an object's velocity changes only when it's acted on by an external force. This means that a body's rate of change in momentum is directly proportional to the force that is applied to the body. This change in momentum happens in the direction of the applied force. Let's take a look at this in equation form. The net force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. 
F in this equation is the net force that is applied, M is the mass of the object, and A is the object's acceleration. Therefore, the net force that is imposed on the object creates a proportional acceleration. And remember, if the net force on the object is zero, then the momentum of the object is constant and unchanging. We learn that from Newton's first law. Now, let's look at our ball again and apply our formula to see what we find. Let's say you apply the exact same force to two different balls. You have a yellow ball and a purple ball, which has a greater mass than the yellow ball. When you apply the same force to them, which one do you think will fly further and faster? Well, we can just plug in some numbers to our formula. So if our force is 10 newtons and our mass is five kilograms for the yellow ball, then our acceleration is two meters per second squared. Let's do the same thing with our purple ball. The force is 10 newtons, the mass is six kilograms. So the acceleration is 1.667 meters per second squared. Working with a real life example and using our formula to solve for the missing variable helps us to see the relationship between mass, acceleration, and force. I hope that this video over Newton's second law of motion helped you to better understand the concept. Hey guys, welcome to this Metrics video over chromosomes. In our last video, we looked at macromolecules and we were able to see how our bodies are composed. Chromosomes are thread-like structures made up of dense DNA strands, which contain genetic coding and instruction in a sequential composition of genes. Chromosomes store, replicate, transcribe, and transmit genetic data in our body's cells. Structure of a chromosome. A chromosome's shape and size will vary with the cell's cycle. When in interface, the chromosomes are not tightly packed, so they are invisible to the human eye. During cell division, the chromatin begins to condense. By the end of prophase, we begin to see well-defined thread-like arrangements materialize called chromonomata. During metaphase and anaphase, the chromonomata start to completely form and compact together and begin configuring into structures of chromatids. This cycle of variation in size and shape of the chromosomes during a cell's cycle is referred to as chromosomal cycle. The formation of chromosomes is most clearly observed at metaphase and anaphase. And the reason is because that is when the chromosomes are the most compact or dense, which makes them easier to see. A normal chromosome will have these parts. A centromere, or a primary constriction. A chromosome in metaphase will have two twin sister chromatids that are connected with one another at a specific point. And this point is called a centromere, also referred to as the primary constriction. You will also notice that it is the point where the two arms of the chromatids begin to narrow. In anaphase, the centromere separates the sister chromatids into two distinct anaphasic chromosomes. Consequently, an anaphase chromosome is really just a metaphase chromosome cut in half. The narrow structures extending from the centromere are referred to as arms. Therefore, a chromosome in metaphase will have four arms, while anaphase chromosomes will only have two arms. If a chromosome's two arms are equal, it is referred to as an isobrachial chromosome. And if the two arms are unequal in length, it is referred to as a heterobrachial chromosome. If a chromosome has arms that are not equal, then the shorter arm is classified as P, and the longer arm is classified as Q. Chromosomes are given four different names based upon the position of the centromere. One, telecentric. This means that the centromere is at the very end of the arm of the chromatid. However, you will not see this in humans. Two, acrocentric. Acrocentric refers to a chromosome with its centromere placed closer to the terminal of one end of the arm, resulting in chromosome arms of different sizes. Three, submetacentric. Submetacentric refers to a chromosome whose centromere is located near the middle, but not directly, so that the arms are still unequal in length. A metacentric chromosome is a chromosome with a centromere that is located in the middle, with two seemingly equal chromosomal arms. The surface of a centromere bear a specialized multi-protein complex called kinetochore. 
to which spindle fibers or microtubules attach. The centromere of a metaphase chromosome contains two kinetochores facing in opposite direction. Secondary constrictions. Besides centromere, a chromosome may have one or more secondary constrictions. The part of a chromosome beyond secondary constriction is called a satellite, which remains attached to the main part of chromosomes by a thread of chromatin. The chromosomes having satellite is called sat chromosome. There are two types of secondary constrictions, nor and joint. They're always constant in their positions and often used as markers. The NOR or NOR nuclear organizer region are specialized to produce nucleolus and rRNA. The joints sometimes develop due to breaking and fusion of chromosome segments. A telomere is a short, repeated DNA sequence, complexed with proteins. They are synthesized separately and later add to the chromosomal tips. The telomeres help in various ways. One, they provide stability by preventing infusions of chromosomes. Two, they act as initiators of synapsis. Three, they help in the shortening of telomeres causing senescence and aging. Chromomeres. Sometimes along the entire length of interphase, chromosomes appear beaded due to accumulation of chromatin. These bead-like structures are called chromomeres. At metaphase, the chromomeres are tightly coiled and are no longer visible. Types of eukaryotic chromosomes. 1. A chromosomes. A chromosomes are the normal invariant set of chromosomes which are diagnostic of the species. B chromosomes are extra chromosomes, mostly heterochromatic, smaller than normal chromosomes and exhibit slower replication. They don't take part in mitosis, segregate randomly, and don't affect phenotype, though may cause a decrease in vigor. These are not homologous with any of the normal chromosomes. They derive from autosomes, cause deleterious effects in animals and plants, and affect fertility when present in large amounts. Functions of chromosomes. Chromosomes contain hereditary information in the form of genes and act as a hereditary vehicle. They control division, growth, metabolism, and differentiation in a cell. The ploidy of chromosomes determines the expression of gametophyte or sporophyte generation. Sex chromosomes determine the sex of the individual. Crossover and aberrations of chromosomes introduce variation in population. Chromosomes transmit hereditary information from generation to generation. I hope that this video over chromosomes was helpful. Hey guys, welcome to this Mometrics video over DNA versus RNA. In our last video, we looked at chromosomes, their structure and their function. In this video, we will take an in-depth look at the structure and function of both DNA and RNA. To start, let's take a look at what DNA and RNA are, and then we will go back through and compare them. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and is a nucleic acid that contains the genetic instruction used in the development and functioning of all known living organisms. DNA is housed in the nucleus of the cell and works as a vehicle for storage and transfer of organisms' genetic information. DNA is a polymer that has a deoxyribose and a phosphate foundation with four nitrogenous bases, adenine and guanine, which are purine, and cytosine and thymine, which are pyrimidine. Now, adenine only pairs with thymine, and guanine only pairs with cytosine. DNA is a double helix structure and looks sort of like a spiraling staircase. The way that it spirals actually helps to give DNA added protection and stability. Let's take a look at exactly why. So DNA has two strands, both located on the lateral ends, and these strands are twisted together like a spiraling staircase, which makes up the double helix. The lateral ends of these strands consist of sugar phosphate backbone of neighboring nucleotides that are bonded with one another. The phosphate molecule forms a covalent bond, which means it shares electrons with the deoxyribose sugar. These hydrogen bonds are what actually cause the DNA strand to spiral. The nitrogenous bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, are sandwiched between the two sugar phosphate strands. 
Each nitrogenous base is directly adjacent to another nitrogenous base, forming hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are weak bonds, but the bonds between the phosphate and sugar molecule are very, very strong bonds, which means they're very stable and can handle resistance. So basically, this phosphate sugar backbone's main job is to hold the nitrogenous bases that function as the coded set of instructions in place and to protect them from outside elements. The spiraling of the sugar phosphate backbone adds 360 degree protection to the nitrogenous bases, rather than the nitrogenous bases being unspiraled and exposed. If it were not spiraled, then the weaker hydrogen bonds between the nitrogenous bases would be exposed to the surrounding elements, which could potentially break the bonds. RNA stands for ribonucleic acid and is a nucleic acid that executes the instructions given by the DNA. RNA is housed in the nucleus and the cytoplasm. The sugar in RNA is ribose. RNA is a single strand chain of alternating phosphate and ribose units with the bases adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil bonded to the ribose. RNA molecules are involved in protein synthesis and sometimes in the transmission of genetic information. The primary role of RNA is to deliver the genetic information or code necessary for the building of proteins from the nucleus to the ribosome. This procedure stops the DNA from exiting the nucleus for the purpose of protecting the DNA. The production of protein is not possible without RNA. RNA is also crucial to the process of DNA transcription. An enzyme called RNA polymerase latches onto the DNA strand, then starts constructing a sequence of nucleotides to assemble a compatible RNA strand. There are three types of RNA. Messenger RNA, or mRNA, ribosomal RNA, or rRNA, and transfer RNA, or tRNA. mRNA is transcribed from DNA, and it transfers the coded in structure for protein synthesis. rRNA is a part of the ribosome and controls the translation of messenger RNA into the proteins. tRNA carries the amino acids that follow the correct coding to the ribosomes to be attached into the proteins. Now, let's review and compare DNA and RNA. DNA has the sugar deoxyribose, while RNA has the sugar ribose. The difference between ribose and deoxyribose are fairly subtle. Ribose has one more OH group than deoxyribose has, and that is the only difference. Though the contrast is subtle, the difference changes the entire function. DNA is double-stranded. RNA, on the other hand, is single-stranded. DNA is more stable under extreme conditions, but RNA is not very stable due to it only being single-stranded. DNA and RNA perform different functions in humans. DNA is responsible for storing and transferring genetic information, while RNA directly codes for amino acids and acts as a messenger between DNA and ribosomes to make proteins. DNA and RNA base pairing is slightly different since DNA uses the bases adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. RNA uses adenine, uracil, cytosine, and guanine. Uracil differs from thymine in that it lacks a methyl group on its ring. In this video, we're going to take a look at Mendelian genetics. Gregor Mendel, who was an Austrian monk, presented a theory of inheritance that he discovered when working with pea plants. Before Mendel's theory, everyone just thought that inheritance was like mixing two things together. For example, if you mix yellow and blue together, then you get green. Likewise, people believe that parents' looks were just kind of mixed together homogeneously in their offspring. I mean, seems pretty legit when all you have to go off of is someone's looks. Well, Gregor Mendel wasn't convinced. So, he did a little research, and what he discovered was that it doesn't quite work that way. He discovered that there are specific units of inheritance that get passed on to the offspring. Alleles get passed within the chromosome that come from each parent. However, even though they get a chromosome from each parent, the children do not always possess traits that the parents pass down. This is because some traits are dominant while some are recessive. 
The alleles that come together are what determine one's phenotype. Phenotype refers to the observation of a trait, like brown eyes, red hair, dimples, etc. This phenomenon is what Gregor Mendel discovered when studying the pea plants. He also noticed that there are three potential pairings of hereditary factors, dominant-dominant, dominant-recessive, and recessive-recessive. If a child possesses the pairing dominant-dominant or dominant-recessive, then that child will show the dominant phenotype. Only if the child receives the pairing recessive-recessive will it then have the recessive phenotype. This can easily be demonstrated with a Punnett square. A Punnett square is a square with four squares within it. In this Punnett square, we have our first parent on top with the pairing recessive-recessive. This means two recessive alleles. A lowercase y is used to notate the allele is recessive. On the left side, we have the second parent with the allele pairing dominant-recessive. The dominant allele is notated by a capital Y. When we cross the alleles from each parent, we always cross row by column, and you move from left to right, always putting the dominant allele to the front or left side. Here is what that looks like. For our first parent in our first column, we have a recessive Y. And for our second parent in our first row, we have a dominant Y. So then we would write capital Y lowercase y in our first box, and so on. Non-Mendelian traits, on the other hand, are traits that don't have complete dominance or recessive alleles from a gene. Mendelian genetics only account for a display of complete dominance or very straightforward genetic patterns. However, there are patterns of genetic inheritance that cannot be tracked using Gregor Mendel's work. Any pattern of genetic theory that do not fit within Gregor Mendel's framework are referred to as non-Mendelian genetics. We will take a look at four different types of non-Mendelian genetics. First, incomplete dominance. So instead of a child displaying either a trait from a dominant allele or a recessive allele, the child would show a mixture of traits. So more than one trait are displayed to some degree, and this is where the term incomplete dominance comes from. Two, co-dominance. In a co-dominant pattern of inheritance, both alleles are displayed equally, and both are displayed in the offspring's phenotype. Three, multiple alleles. The non-Mendelian pattern of inheritance happens when there is the potential for more than two alleles to express a single characteristic, like blood type, for example. There are three possible alleles for blood type. Four, sex-linked traits. Sex-linked traits are exactly what they sound like. They are genes that are located on the sex chromosome and are inherited that way. So if a gene is located on the Y chromosome, then it can only be inherited by males. I hope that this video over Mendelian and non-Mendelian genetics was helpful to you. If you enjoyed it, then be sure to give us a like and subscribe to our channel for further videos. See you guys next time.